flexors and protection devices product line inside of TI. Today, we're going to be talking about mid-voltage latch of immune multiplexers and switches. This was put together by me and one of my marketing colleagues, Samir Aurora. So for a brief agenda, first, we're just going to go over what latch up is and some latch up immunity. We're going to go into CMOS latch up, what, how we achieve latch up immunity and latch up immune multiplexers, what kind of benefits that offers the system. Then we're going to go into our TMUX 72XX product family, which is new re newly released latch up immune devices. And then we're going to, going to go into the TMUX 7XXXF line, which is our newly released latch up immune and fault protected devices. So they add, add a few additional fault protection features, which I'll go into when we get. So what is latch up? Latch up essentially is just a fault condition which creates a short circuit between the supply rails and it will not resolve until the power cycle of the system is destroyed. Essentially what it is doing is that you're just shorting together either VDD to VSS or VDD to ground. And that causes a circuit that causes a short circuit current to destroy the device that is latching up as well as possibly damage any other device that is in between those two power rails. So what causes latch up? Latch up is essentially just caused when an injected current or a input exceeds one of the voltage ratings, either power, either of the power rails. This can cause a parasitic structure, typically a PNPN structure referred to as a cyrister or a silicone controlled rectifier to uh, essentially what it does is it shorts uh, VDD to VSS or ground. So as a brief example, what we can see is this is a basic CMOS inverter with, with the cross section. And what you can see is we can see a, uh, a parasitic PNPN structure formed between the N well and the P substrate. And as you can see between the VDD and VSS pins, there is a circuit that will turn on essentially when you have an injected current or an electrical overstress event. So the equivalent circuit kind of just looks like this for the, for the CMOS inverter which is very similar that you're going to see in many other uh, structures that can be latch up. So this is essentially you have our IOs and when an IO is, has an injected current, it'll cause Q2 to turn on, which will cause Q1 to turn on, which will cause a VDD to ground short. The same will happen if you have an over voltage or an under voltage event, it'll cause one of these transistors to turn on and then the positive feedback loop will cause it to essentially keep going until there is no power to go. So you have to shut off power and cycle the system. So latch of immunity is just essentially to prevent that. So how do we prevent it? So there are two common ways among a bunch of different other smaller ways, but the two biggest ones are an insulated trench. So essentially what we do is that you take a uh, insulated oxide trench. So silicon dioxide is usually used to separate the PMOS and the NMOS transistors in a CMOS substrate. And so therefore the PNPN structure no longer exists. So since it doesn't exist, it can't short the rails together. Another way that you can do this is by adding guard rings. So guard rings are essentially just dummy, dummy pins that are going to siphon off charge from an electrical overstress or an injected current event. What these do is essentially they just in, they absorb all the extra charge to keep that a parasitic structure from actually forming. So what you can see over here is that with guard rings, you make the circuit a lot more complicated and essentially what ends up happening is it prevents latch up from occurring. The reason, though, that all lat parts are not latch up immune is because there is a trade off. Obviously, as you can see, you're going to be adding more to the die. You're going to be adding more to the actual geometry of the silicon itself. Not all devices are going to be able to do that because of size constraints, and you may not be able to hit this certain specifications, especially more precision systems, by making a latch up immune because you're going to violate some size restraint, or you're not going to be able to fit all the circuits that you need to in the size profile that you'll need. So it's not always possible to have latch of immune parts. So therefore, that's why the outside, the, the input and output of a system should really be latch of immune, especially in industrial environments where they're exposed to a lot more fault conditions. That brings up what are the benefits of using latch of immune multiplexers in a system. So essentially, the basic idea is that they can help mitigate system damaging faults. Let's look at this diagram on the right. So we can see a very generalized system. We have subsystem A communicating with subsystem B, and we're using an eight to one multiplexer to do that. Subsystem A, the multiplexer, and subsystem B are all connected to VDD and ground. There's two possible scenarios. The first scenario is if this multiplexer is not latch up immune. If subsystem A or B produces an injected current or an EOS event on the IO of that MUX, VDD will be pulled to ground. 
and that could potentially damage not only the multiplexer, but also subsystem B and subsystem A components. However, in the second scenario, if we're using a logic immune multiplexer, if subsystem A, B produces an injected kernel or EOS event on the IO of the MUX, VDD will not be pulled to ground and preventing damage to subsystems A and B. The multiplexer may still take damage, but it will prevent system damaging faults. So, but using some other discrete protection devices along with a logic immune device can really guarantee full reliability and robustness of your system in fault conditions. This brings us to our first line of uh, parts that I'd like to look at, which is the TMUX 72 XX family. This is a plus 44 volt max inputs to a low R on multiplexer with a higher current capability and latch of immune. So some features are single supply. We have a very wide range from four and a half volts to 44 volts. It also supports dual supply operation from four and a half volts to a dual 22. It's rail to rail analog input range. So therefore VSS to VDD is going to be passed through the device. It has 1.8 volt control logic, which means that the GP, the control pins are going to be able to be accessed by a 1.8 volt source. However, it can handle up to 44 volts on the logic pin. So therefore you're not going to damage it by using a higher, higher voltage on that signal, but it conforms to 1.8 volt logic le levels. These multiplexers are also very precise, so they're going to have very low impact on the signal chain itself. They're going to have very low leakage current, about 100 picoamps typical to 10 nanoamps maximum. So in higher impedance systems, they're going to have a lot lower offset due to these leakage currents because you're at very small levels. And you're only going to be hitting that 10 nanoamps max when you're pushing the maximum temperature and running the device near max constraint. So realistically, you're probably going to be somewhere in between that low, the typical and then max closer to the typical, depending on your operating conditions. We have low, low charge injection, so that's going to result in very low error at the output compared to other mid voltage devices. So we're reading about 15 picocoulombs typical, uh, low on resistance. So these are going to have very, very low resistance, very low attenuation of signals going through. You're going to only have about two ohms. So that's going to be relatively to high impedance loads. It's essentially like it's not even there. And for lower impedance loads, you're going to have a lot less attenuation. Some protection features that this device does have is latch immunity, which I've already kind of went through a little bit, but also fail safe logic. So fail safe logic is the idea that the device will not uh, be affected. The switch will not turn on or off when the device is off, even if there is a signal on the logic pin. So the signals on the logic pin can accept zero to 44 volts at any time on power or under power, and the device will not activate or like pay attention to the logic until VDD is active and you won't break, you won't break the logic by putting like a 44 volt signal on that logic pin when you have like a five volt source on the VDD. There are multiple packages that we have in this family, main, mainly PW and QFM, which are P2P with competition parts. So some applications, just generally speaking, is AT, e-test equipment, data acquisition systems, battery monitoring, programmable logic controllers, analog input modules. Essentially, a lot of it is you're just kind of interfacing between some smart processing system, either amplifiers, ADCs, or MCUs, and you're using a multiplexer to multi either mux in multiple different sources, or to just cut down on GPIO usage for one of these systems, uh, channel sharing. And these are just great parts for more mid voltage environments. So up to about 44 volts. Some benefits are that there's a wide supply range, rail to rail operation, low R on and high current capability allows wide range current measurements. So obviously these parts are going to be a little more robust than some of the lower voltage parts, kind of as I pointed out through the features. So some devices that we have that are either in preview or available right now are the TMUX 7219, which is a two to one one channel device. We have the 721X family, which is a one to one four channel device. And the only difference between those three parts is the logic configuration. One of them is active low, active high, and then there's a mixed level logic. Then we have the 7208, which is an eight to one, one channel and the 7209, which is a four to one two channel. So we have a lot of different configurations that can cover, that can cover a lot of, a wide range of applications. So just to kind of go through the TMUX 7219, uh, to kind of highlight one part, once again, we're having very similar features to the whole family 
one thing to point out is that we also expect the R on flatness for each individual device. So that's going to be how much your on resistance changes over input voltage. And for the 7219 and most of the 72XX line, this is very low. For the 7219, we're looking about at 0.85 ohms max. That means running this device at max conditions, you're only going to see a deviation of about 0.85 ohms over the entire voltage range. So once again, you have a very low typical on resistance to about 2.1 ohms. Once again, same protection features as the as the 72XX line. The packages that we offer right now are the DGK, which is a VSOP package, which is P2P with competition. It operates from negative 40C to 125C. It operates in a lot of the same in a lot of similar applications that we that we uh, showed before, as well as a few new ones that I've mentioned, which is the RRU as well as some semiconductor test equipment and EV charging stations. So for an RRU, essentially a very brief input just to kind of show, we have an output voltage, we have our MCU voltage, and we can switch between, we have our MCU controlling. So we're going to have an output voltage from a DAC switching between that and a resistor to either negative 12 or zero volt, depending on the architecture. And that's going to be helping with our gate biasing for an RF, for one of these RRU units. <clears throat> Another one that we can do is an ultrasonic sensing gas meter, which we've seen where we use a 7219 switch between the RX and the TX pass for the transducers. And then also we have an EV charging station where we just have, uh, basically we're creating a PWM signal by switching between two voltage sources and having a known uh, square wave, like 50-50 duty cycle or whatever duty cycle we want since the PWM generator going to that select pin. And just kind of a little more uh, details into the idea, into the power gate amplifier, kind of mentioning why this is either negative 12 or zero. As you can see, it kind of just depends on what we're looking at, what kind of uh, architecture we're using. So for gain application, we're between eight and negative 12, and for an LDM, LDMOS application, we're between five and zero. The 7219 with a wide operating range can actually uh, support both different modes and both architectures. So the wide operating range allows the 7219 to be used in a lot of different features in a lot of different applications. So the next line of family is a little bit different. It's kind of a subset of the overall mid voltage latch of immune line and their latch of immune plus fault protection devices. So the 70, uh, the seven XXX F family is a subset of the latch of immune and mid voltage portfolio and the extra fault protection is kind of laid out in this chart. So our 72XX line is latch of immune and fails and has fail safe logic. It does not have power off protection and under, uh, over voltage and under voltage protection. Whereas the 7XXXF line does. It contains two more protection features that are very beneficial to your system and can help replace some discrete protection features on your device, on your system. So latch of immune, once again, does not the device does not latch up, therefore mitigating system damaging during current injection or EOS. Failsafe logic means that the device is in an off state until valid VDD. Logic pin can accept zero volts and max rated VDD when the device is VDD equals zero, as well as when uh, the VDD is not equal to the max VDD. Powered off protection is that the device remains high Z when VDD equals zero volts. Essentially, that means it can accept plus or minus 60 volts on an analog input pin with respect to ground, with respect to the ground pin without sustaining damage and only passing a small leakage current through the device. So if you have a system that where one subsystem comes online before the one that is going to pass data to comes on and that multiplexer is off, that multiplexer will essentially isolate the system and will only allow a small uh, leakage current to pass through, basically protecting downstream devices that may not, also not have power on. And finally, we also have OV and UV protection. So the devices can detect faults plus or minus 60 volts with respect to ground or plus or minus 85 volts from supply to analog IO and responds by either opening the output or clamping it to the positive fault supply, VDD or VFP, depending on the device. There's a little bit of a variation between our fault protected devices exactly how they react. So we're gonna go into some of our parts that we do have released or are uh, Come up and coming soon to release, which is part of our TMUX 73XXF and our TMUX 74XXF family. So once again, we have our plus or minus 60 volt protection, as well as a wide supply range. We have a dual supply range from dual from dual five to dual 24 from an 8248 single voltage protection. So we have our over voltage tolerance and over voltage protection. 
So we have our plus or minus 85 volts from supply to uh, source or drain pins. We have our over voltage protection plus or minus 60 volts with respect to ground. So both of those specs need to be uh, taken in consideration because depending on your supply, sometimes that 85 volt is going to reduce your over voltage protection. So if you have a higher voltage supply, you may possibly not get the full negative 60 volts, depending. There is there's in the data sheets provided at the end of the document, it kind of goes over how to calculate that. Uh, but some other powered off protection, once again, is that plus and minus 60 volts on the input pins. Uh, a lot, some of them have adjustable over triggering, over voltage triggering threshold. So some devices will trigger at VDD or VSS if you go above the threshold voltage or below that threshold voltage. However, devices like 7462F, actually you can set VF and VFN, which are going to be fault supplies. And those fault supplies are going to be what is going to be setting the threshold. So if an input or an input goes above or below those fault supplies, that's when it will trigger instead of VDD. However, you can still connect those directly to VDD and VSS to make sure that you have that level as well. Some of the devices also include interrupt flags. So essentially it will send out a little flag value saying, hey, there's a fault this fault is active on this channel and you can essentially respond to it as such. Uh, the R on flatness for them for the 73XX is about 4 ohms, so it's going to vary about 4 ohms over the course of the input voltage range. And for the 74XX, we actually have a lot lower flatness and it only is going to change about 0.5 ohms over the entire range. So an interesting thing about these devices is that non-fault channels are going to continue operating with low leakage current. So essentially only the channel that experiences the fault is going to react, which is great because that means there's only one part of the system is going to react. The whole system isn't put in jeopardy because of one fault channel and the other fault and the other non-fault channels are going to react with a lot lower current. These are once again, latch up immune by construction. They have logic levels of 1.8 volts to VDD. So they're 1.8 volt logic as well. Very low distortion for our 74XX line, so our THD is around 0.015%. Uh, fully specified from negative 40 to 125 ambient temperature, and we have a TSOP and some small the industry standard TSOP as well as some WQFM packages in this family. Once again, we're going to see these in a lot of the same applications of the 72XX line. Uh, factory automation, field transmitters, PLCs, uh, analog input modules, AT test equipment, battery monitoring, since it's essentially serving the same purpose. However, it's kind of integrating some more fault protection so you don't have to add as many discrete components or other ICs to the line to gain uh, reliability and robustness in your system. So once again, the benefits kind of have, as I've talked about, is the fault tolerance, the better system tolerance, and it's also compatible, compatible with next-gen processors because of that 1.8 volt uh, logic support and logic compliance. So some interesting, here's some diagrams that basically shows a fault detection circuit will kind of control the switch and the output will either clamp or could possibly open. As you can see, we have a very, uh, a graph showing how the source is going to go above, above VDD. And as soon as it does, we have no overshoot on the drain and drain will just drop in the, when it is opening up. And as you can see, we have no overshoot because of that fault condition. And to kind of go into that for one of the devices, the 7308F, which is just an eight to one uh, multiplexer that has the same parameters as we just kind of talked about. We actually did some testing on this. So we have some lab data of that being shown. We have our VS input going above our VDD supply, our VDD supply. And we can see our VDD output doesn't even rise all the way to the VDD and will crash because of the fault protection response. So the 7308, what it does, it opens at the output and we're gonna have no overshoot because of that. So this is gonna be able to detect downstream components because we're not gonna have those high voltage faults even leaks through at all. We're going to be able to prevent that and therefore protecting downstream devices by using these devices with the OV and UV protection. So essentially some competitiveness about this device for the 7308 is to kind of go through it. Once again, we have a 60, negative 60 volt to positive 60 volt over voltage tolerance. We have about 250 typical ohms to 380 ohms. That extra fall protection adds a little bit of our, a little bit of resistance to channel. However, the R on flatness is still very low at only four ohms. And this is what's really going to matter because that flatness is actually going to be causing distortion in your signal. So you want a low flatness value. That other 
resistance value, it's more or less going to act like a constant resistor. So the less it varies, the more con the more the more uh, accurate your system is going to be because essentially you're just adding a very predictable scalar mul uh, scalar multiplier on your voltage by passing it through that mux. Once again, we have very, very small leakage current. Typically, we're running about 300 picoamps, but a max of 25 nanoamps. We are running a little bit higher IED, so we're going to be running about 1.3 milliamps because of all the extra features in the device and because it's more of a precision device as well. We have a very fast uh, transition time. That fast transition time obviously is going to help us settle and has higher speed and it has higher speed to act, acquire data and data acquisition systems because you're not going to have to wait for a settling time because of a slow transition. We have pretty uh, low capacitance overall, so only about 19 picofarads typical when the channel is closed. That's about adding a very small capacitor to that line, so that's going to add very low distortion and going to essentially allow higher frequency signals to pass through since we do have a lower on capacitance. Once again, we have our 1.8 volt logic compatible as well as our protection features, which I've already kind of mentioned, but we also have our ESD, which is the one thing I didn't mention, which is really in a lot of our devices, but we have enhanced this one to 8 kV for a human body mo model, so it has enhanced protection for industrial applications. There are a few different options for this right now, which is the QFN, the TSOP, and the SOIC pa package, and the QFN PCB footprint is about 50% smaller than our TSOP. So we do offer industry standard as well as some small packages to open up the door for possible potential opportunities in different various systems. So to kind of to go into another part that's more of an interesting and unique, unique one for our product line is the 7462F. So it is a quad channel protector. So this is slightly different from a multiplexer as it actually does not have control pins. You don't control it. What it does, it acts as a switch that is closed, that is normally closed, unless you have, that is normally closed, unless it detects a fault. When it detects a fault, it can either clamp, it will either clamp to the uh, fault voltage that you've specified, so VFP, or it will open the circuit like you saw in the 7308. It only responds to fault conditions, but more or less, it operates very similarly to a four a four channel one to one switch, except it only opens in cases of fault or cases of power off. So once again, the power off protection is our plus or minus 60 volts. If VDD is not there, the switch is going to be up high impedance and it's not going to allow signals to pass very low leakage current. And we're going to also have our over voltage protection and over voltage tolerance that we is pretty similar to these devices. It's over, it's adjustable because we have a VFP and VFN on it, and it also has interrupt flags to indicate over voltage volt, over voltage faults. So what this allows us to do is essentially it's just protection and it's a smart protection feature. So essentially you put it in, you assign the voltage threshold the threshold through VFP and VFN. And with that, you're going to be able to, and with that, you're going to be able to essentially control the device. So here's kind of a Gen generic idea of how this device looks. So we're just basically going to have our switch pin, our switch driver, which is our driver pin is just essentially going to set the mode either open or either open at fault or clamp to VFP at fault. So for this specific diagram, as you can see, we have our VDD and VSS set to plus or minus 15 volts, and we have our VFP to VFN at plus or minus 10 volts. So another reason that you may want to implement a system like this too is because generally speaking, multiplexers are going to hit their best performance at maximum supplies. So uh, nearer to that plus or minus 24 volts, you're going to get the best, you're going to get the lowest on resistance, you're going to get the best channel performance, generally speaking. But that, with that being said, essentially, that being said, what you can do is you can also set your voltage. So if you have downstream components that are lower, voltage than your actual MUX voltage, you can actually set those triggers accordingly. And it's going to have our same uh, format as before. It's going to have no over voltage, no output over voltage. So just as a general overview, we do have some resources that can kind of go into this. So right now we have a application report about using latch up immune multiplexers to help improve system reliability. So this just kind of goes into a little deeper view about what latch up immunity does as well as I've kind of linked these data sheets. So when this uh, 
presentation goes live online. These data sheets are all linked, so you can kind of see some of the devices that we have available right now. We have a full like lineup of different configurations, and both are just normal latch immune plus are fault protected. We have a we have our two to one as our seventy two nineteen, our eight to one and four to one two channel. In our 7208 and 9 data sheet, we have our four channel one to ones right here. And then, as some other devices that I've talked about, the 7308F, which is a eight to one fault protected device, the 7412, which is just a four channel one to one switch, but this one has control pins and you can actually control it as well as having that fault protection. And the 7462F, which essentially is just allowing is just the channel protector that will open or clamp to VFP in case of a fault condition. Some other, and we are also currently working on a few uh, reports that will be out within the next months or so that are going into how to use these fault protected devices and other analog input modules. So keep an eye out for that. So, and we you will be able to find that and more information about all of our switch products here at uh, ti.com backslash switch forward slash switches. <clears throat> And with that, uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for everyone for joining. And if you have any, any, if you have any further questions, or if you have any questions in the future about any of our parts, please be sure to reach out to your FAE or reach out directly on E2E, because me or one of my other applications engineering colleagues will be able to reach out and help you with your issue. So please have a great rest of your day, and thank you for your time. Thank you everybody for joining today. And um, like we said, you can find the PDF version of the slides and the recording uh, later this afternoon at www.ti.com slash NPU. And we hope we see you same time next week for our topic, which is integrated isolated data and power solutions achieve class B emissions. Um, so we hope to see you then. Have a great week, everybody.